Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is India Pierre Ingram. I'm the Senior Associate at Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. And today we'll be walking through the Project Support 2021 Application Workshop. Before we begin, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge those of the Shawnee, Miami, Erie, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Haudenosaunee Confederacy, whose lands we stand on, and the thousands of Native Americans who represent over 100 tribes who currently live in Northeast Ohio today. Dan, next slide, please. We also would like to currently acknowledge what's happening in our country around racial injustice and the current um, movement and protests for Black Lives Matter. So Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture stands in solidarity with those protesting racial injustice in our community and across our country. Black Lives Matter. We condemn the racist acts of police brutality that continue to impact Black people in Cuyahoga County and across our country. We recognize that the creation and perpetuation of racial inequalities is embedded into government and grant making. To arts organizations led by and serving people of color and artists of color, we see you, we hear you, and we stand with you. CAC remains committed to racial equity and supports efforts to declare racism a public health crisis in the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. We invite white led organizations and white artists to take action and connect with resources to perpetuate racial equity in your organizations and communities. Join with us to take action and share resources with colleagues and friends. We must work together actively to move towards racial justice and strengthen our community. Next slide, Dan. CAC has claimed as an organization value specific uh, equity, specifically racial equity. Equity is defined as the fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people, while at the same time striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. Equity is the separate targeted treatment in order to meet the needs of those marginalized. Equity relates to strategies that are needed to impact institutional barriers. Equity is a process, a practice, and an outcome. We've been doing our own internal learning and pro programmatic adjustments, and we've been offering opportunities for our grant recipients to learn along with us. You can find more information, more information on our website, including our Power of Words video and our Racial Equity Language video. Just visit cacgrants.org backslash equity. Next slide. So today's goals. Today's goals is learning about CAC and the project support program, understanding how to navigate our current application process, and learning about the funding criteria and application structure, and get tips for success and have your questions answered. If at any point during this um, workshop you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat box that's at the bottom in that for me, it's a black bar next to participants. You can add your chats and make sure it's for everyone so we can all see it or directly to CAC grants. And we'll be answering those questions at the end. Next slide, Dan. Cuyahoga County, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture is a public funder for arts and culture in Cuyahoga County. We are a political subdivision of the state of Ohio and our footprint is Cuyahoga County. Cuyahoga County residents created Cuyahoga Arts and Culture in 2006 when they approved a tax on cigarettes to support arts and culture in our community. The levy was renewed in 2015 and now runs through 2026. Our mission is to inspire and strengthen the community by investing in arts and culture. Cuyahoga Arts and Culture achieves its mission by investing in 501c3 arts and culture organizations and projects in Cuyahoga County through its two main grant programs general operating support and the project support program, which you guys are all applying for. Since 2006, we invested more than 150 million in arts and cultural organizations and activities across the county. This year, CAC is investing 11.8 million through grants to organizations who bring arts and culture to life in our community, including 1.6 million to over 200 arts organizations arts organizations receiving project support funding, and 10.2 million to another 65 organizations receiving general operating support funding. It's through these investments that we work to realize CAC's vision that every resident can experience a meaningful cultural life. Next slide, please. 
CEC does have other opportunities if you're not going through our project support process or if potentially other ways that you can engage with CEC. So some of those opportunities is our support for artist opportunities, which include our Karamu in the, in the room residency, which will be open in the fall and winter. And then there's spaces which offers um, a current grant called Urgent Art Fund for artists. We also have our um, connection with Neighborhood Connections, which is their neighbor up grants. And they also are currently doing a COVID-19 project response fund as well. We also have, which is a support for artist opportunity, the Center for Performance Arts and Civit's Practice Learning Lab, which allowed for organizations and artists to work together to co-create a civic project. We also have our IOB Match Fund for Arts and Culture Projects, which is currently open and available to find matching grants for a current community project that's being led. We also have our ClevelandArtsEvents.com, which allows for anyone to post free events, jobs, and artist profiles. So if you ever would like to post any events that you have or any job opportunities or artist opportunities, feel free to head to that site most likely if you're a current um, grantee, you most likely have a profile and are able to submit um, any events and jobs that you have. We also have our Arts and Culture Network Night, which will be virtual and, and it offers potential and opportunities to engage with community residents as well as other artists with other arts organizations. And those will be upcoming and you can find actually that on our clevelandartsevents.com where it can be posted as well as the neighborhood grants website as well, Facebook. We also offer Racial Equity Institute virtual groundwater sessions, and that will allow five staff slash volunteers for virtual groundwater training paid for by CAC. So reach out to your program manager if you'd like to be offered that opportunity if you're a current grantee. Next slide, please. So here are a few pictures of some of the events and activities that have been supported by CAC funding in the past few years. We'll get into the specific, like the specific project requirements later on, but many of the organizations that receive CAC funding do not have a primary mission of arts and culture, but they are doing amazing arts and culture programming through their work. Grant recipients include community developed corporations, after school programs, and mental health, mental health agencies as well as organizations that focus only on arts and culture programming. It's also important to point out that CAC's definition of arts and culture, which is based on the Ohio Revised Code, includes natural sciences. This means that we fund science and nature-based programming, in addition to other disciplines like music, performing arts, and visual arts, as you can see in this wonderful array of photos. Next slide, please. So CEC is also currently aware of the COVID-19 pandemic that is happening within our community and nationally and internationally. So we do have a response to that as well. For our current 2020 project support grantees, you have the opportunity if your project has been canceled or postponed by COVID-19, you may extend your project into 2021, which effectively, effectively transfers your 2020 grant to next year. And this takes place of submitting an application for 2021. If you've already submitted an eligibility check and you're thinking about actually doing the other opportunity of extending your 2020 grant into 2021, please reach out to your program manager and they'll be happy to assist. There's additional flexibility for current impacted projects. CAC board did approve changes to the 2020 grant agreements. Please contact your program manager for more information. We also are asking for any CAC funded projects. They must plan to pr protect public health, which means there is a written plan required prior to release of 2020 advance payments around what you'll be doing to protect um, your community or the residents or the artists who will be joining you. And during your 2021 application, you will find that we require a written plan for how you will incorporate public health requirements into your project. Next slide, and I'll be actually turning it over to my teammate, Louise. Hello folks, Luis Gomez here, pronouns are he, his, him, and I am one of the three program managers. Thank you again for making it today. So I will be taking on this part of the presentation. So what is project support? 
As many of you know, there are two levels of project support grants. They have different eligibility criteria, different application requirements, and different grant amounts. You should have received an email from Fluid Review, our online application and reporting system that lets you know which grant program you're in and also your grant amount. And this is based on the eligibility check that was due last Thursday, June 25th. If you haven't received this email or don't know what I'm talking about, make sure to contact your program manager right away. We're still processing a lot of the eligibility criteria through Fluid Review. And so if you haven't received that email yet, you might be receiving in the next few days, and that will include your total grant amount that you're eligible to apply for. PS2 is a more simplified application where PS1 has more questions, including a budget table and a data funder report. Just to let you know, you submitted an a data funder report for your eligibility check. If you're applying for Project Support 1, you will be required to resubmit this funder report once you submit your application. Next slide, Dan. So let's talk about the process. So if you've all completed the first step, which was to submit your eligibility check by June 25th at 4.30, so congratulations on getting that done. The next deadline is the application deadline, which is gonna be August 6th, 4.30 p.m., which is a Thursday. So please make sure to submit your application by the deadline. If you have any concerns or questions about this, please contact your program manager. Then in September, our panel review will take process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a future slide. And then in November, our board will approve all the grants that were recommended by panelists for funding. Grant and grant amounts are not formally made until the Board of Trustees approves the scores and grant amounts at their November board meeting. All CAC board meetings are open to the public and you are invited us to join us this year, but it is not a requirement. Um, due to the fact that we are currently in a pandemic, our board meeting will most likely meet via Zoom and will be presented via a YouTube link, similar to our June board meeting, I mean our April board meeting, if you were in attendance in, to that. Next slide. So let's talk about the grant review process. There's a different panel review for each of the grant programs. Project Support 1 applications are reviewed by a live panel of arts and culture professionals. Panelists are assigned to your application, will review all the materials and discuss the application before scoring it. You are welcome to attend these sessions or listen to them via the live stream of the panel proceedings. This year, due to the pandemic as well, our in-person panel will all happen online. So keep an eye out for information regarding that panel review. We are still in the process of planning that. This will be our first time doing our in-person panel online. Project Support 2 applicants are reviewed by a panel of arts and cultural professionals, but they do not meet um, online or discuss the application with one another. Each panelist reviews the scores and each application um, scores each application independently, leaving a written comment that explains their score. And I wanna clarify that last year, we did not require panelists for Project Support 2 to leave a comment if they selected yes or somewhat as a score. We only requested that they leave a comment if they said no to the applicant. So if your panel comments included no written comments and you scored all yes, that is a reason why there is no panel feedback. For both our programs, um, staff have no influence in the decision making. Staff handles the logistics and ensures that panelists are reviewing according to the funding criteria. There is no interaction between applicants and panelists. The application must stand on its own. And we do ask panelists if there is any conflict of interest with any of the organizations that they are reviewing. Panelists and arts and cultural professionals are from outside the region in order to prevent any sort of biases or favoritism for organizations that are applying for funding. Since the panelists are from outside the region, do not assume the panelists know anything about your organization or the work you do or your community. Do not use acronyms or rely on information that might be unfamiliar to someone not involved in this work or from this region. If possible, have someone from outside your organization or even maybe someone outside of Cuyahoga County read your application before submitting it and ask them if there's anything that is unclear or vague or any information that they are unaware of. 
I just participated in a panel review for Indianapolis and a lot of applicants had information about local sites, local neighborhoods, but provided no additional information. And to me, that prevented me from having a full grasp of what the applicant was applying for and what the work that they were doing was. So keep that in mind. Next slide. So let's talk about the funding criteria. They are public benefit, artistic and cultural vibrancy, and organizational capacity. Public benefit carries the most weight, and that is true for both Project Support 1 and Project Support 2. The reason why the funding criteria matters is that it helps ensure a transparent review of all applicants. Panelists use the funding criteria to score your application, and panelists assess all parts of your application um, against the funding criteria, including your budget, your narrative, and your support materials. If your application shows evidence of meeting CAC funding criteria, you will be eligible for funding. For Project Support 1, we do that on a 100-point scale, so you must score a minimum of 75 points in order to be recommended for funding. Um, if you score below that, you will not be recommended for funding. Project Support 2, any applicant that demonstrates evidence that they meet the funding criteria, all three of the funding criteria will be recommended for project support to grants. Uh, full funding or partial funding, a minimum of 75% of the request amount. Next slide, please. So this is a continuum of the funding criteria. You should take the time to read through each of the funding criteria. It's good to have an idea of what the funding, it's good to have the funding criteria handout handy when you are writing your application. Remember the panelists use the exact same criteria to score your application and they have when they are reviewing your application. Let's spend some time um, to cover each of the funding criteria and talk about where and how you might address each of the, them in your application. So the first one we're gonna start with is public benefit. Um, and public benefit is defined as an, organization, as an organization's ability to meaningfully engage with its community through its project. As a public funder, this is the most heavily emphasized of the funding criteria because our funding does come from tax revenue, which is paid by Cuyahoga County residents. An example of a strong public benefit is Praxis um, Fiber Workshop receives funding for their natural dye garden. As part of their project, residents from the Collingwood neighborhood are the ones that are taking care of the garden, that they are looking out for the garden, that they're, they're informing other residents about the purpose of this natural dye garden, along with individuals from outside of their community and people that are working currently for Praxis or potentially students at, um, a variety of schools that they work with. I want to continue this example with how they've shifted this through the COVID pandemic. Um, they felt that it was not safe for public resident for residents to be outside in the garden and working with one another in close proximities because of the pandemic. So what they did to shift their project was is at the beginning of the season, they allow different residents, different community members, different supporters to adopt a plant and take it home and plant it in their own garden. And then at the end of the harvest season, bring it back to Praxis in order for it to be processed for their natural dye gardens. That is another example of how they continue their public benefit through this pandemic, working with their community, ensuring the safety of the community and making sure that their project will still be able to be completed. The second funding criteria is artistic and cultural vibrancy, and that is defined as an organization's ability to create a quality project that inspires and challenges its community. We do use the term excellence or artistic quality because they are very subjective. An example of a strong arts and cultural arts and cultural vibrancy example is if you survey your participants, either students, concert members, anyone who you consider a participant, artists or anyone within your community, and you use that survey information to plan your future programming, 
give, you can give ex specific examples of how that feedback was used to implement, it was implemented into your program. The next example is organizational capacity, and that is defined as an organization's ability to successfully plan and manage um, its project. And ex um, this is the least heavily emphasized of the funding criteria, but it that we are being good stewards of public dollars. An example of strong organizational capacity is if your mission is an arts and culture, your organization's mission is not arts and culture, um, panelists want to know how is an organization that is not focused on arts and culture, it, how are you making sure that you are involving the right people, specifically artistic talent, in planning this project? So what some organizations have done in order to show this is attach a list of all the artistic individuals, artist-based communities or organizations that are involved in the planning process and implementation of this art-based project. Next slide, please. So we're gonna shift a little bit from our funding criteria and our application process and talk about our commitment to equity, which India mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. While the funding criteria has not changed, we did make one small clarification to, in the definition of public benefit um, a couple of years ago, two years ago. We added the word respect. Organizations now must demonstrate that they understand, respect, and work with, and respond to the communities in which they want to work with. Our decision to call out respect links directly to our value around equity and to the pattern that we have noticed in reviewing both grant applications and grant reports. Many of our grantees are, received, are serving communities of color, economically disadvantaged communities, or communities that differ in language or culture or from the majority of the grantee's staff. We are committed to being equitable and inclusive, and as our partner organizations, we hope that you will do the same. Centering equity requires those in privileged positions, for example, along the lines of class, race, or language, to acknowledge that while people from other backgrounds do things differently, that doesn't make them or what they are doing wrong. Within our definition of public benefit, we all have also added that you are sharing power with the community that you are serving. Sharing power, shifting power is essential in being racially equitable and moving towards racial justice. Next slide, please. We all operate from a set of cultural frames of reference that challenge, the challenge is that we routinely interpret other people's actions solely through our own cultural frames. This increases the likelihood that we will misinterpret their actions. We encourage you to widen your aperture and attempt to see others from a different perspective. One way of doing this is by asking different questions. Instead of designing a program or a project around all the things that you suspect are dis deficient in a group of people or in a neighborhood, what if you are not there to fix? What if you are there to enhance what is already present? How does that reframe the description and ultimately your, pro your program and your project? Next slide, please. A great tool to use when you are trying to be more equitable is use asset-based thinking. In communities across our county, um, residents celebrate their cultures, express their creativity, and revel in the beauty of their neighborhoods. While those things are expressed differently, they, aren't con they are consistent themes no matter what those locations are. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, uh, but as Lisa was saying, um, we want organizations to focus on the positivity that's already present in communities. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a future slide, but I think um, the key takeaway from this from this slide is the quote at the bottom there, engaging with communities is a win for you, your organization, and it's a win for the residents of those communities. Positivity is always there. Think of it as mutual exchange. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, so I should introduce myself before I get too far ahead. My name is Dan McLaughlin, he, him. I'm also one of the program managers here at Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, and I have been the next slide guy during this whole webinar when uh, Luis and India needed to move to the next slide. So now I'm, now I'm doing it, doing it all. <laughs> um, we'll talk a little bit about what a CAC project is. Um, and this is all listed in the guidelines for the 2021 Project Support 1 and Project Support 2 uh, grant program. But a project is 
either a single event or a series of related events. And by related events, we mean that projects can be multi-day, they can be multifaceted, they can have multiple components, but there has to be a cohesive theme and some cohesive goals that tie that project together. Um, a project is time specific. It starts and ends in 2021, calendar year 2021. Um, you will be asked to list the project dates of, of your project when it starts and when it ends. And just want to make clear that um, because a project has a defined period of time, your project should not have a start date of January 1st and an end date of December 31st. It should be more specific than that. Um, a project needs to be arts and cultural by CAC's definition. Our definition of arts and culture is pulled from the Ohio Revised Code. It's legally what uh, it's the, the definition of arts and culture that we are legally bound by, um, by our authorizing legislation. And you can find that definition in uh, the, the guidelines um, and available in, in those resources. And then lastly, a uh, project needs to take place in Cuyahoga County and be open to the public. And when we say um, open to the public, it does not necessarily mean that it has to be free. It does not necessarily mean that it has to be open to anybody who um, wants to participate, but it does need to be open and accessible to the community that you intend to work with. Um, you're allowed to charge admission for your program, right? You're allowed to sell tickets and you're allowed to recoup some of the costs that way. Um, and you're also allowed to limit who's able to participate. A good example of that would be we work with youth, youth serving programs, the Boys and Girls Club, after school programs. If a person like me decided I wanted to go take band classes at the Boys and Girls Club, that wouldn't be appropriate. So there's, there's understandable and natural um, limitations that you're able to put in there and still meet that definition of open to the public. Other examples might be art therapy programs or other uh, programs that work with sensitive populations. Um, I do see that Luis is back, so I'm going to hand it back to Luis. Uh, Perfect. Thank you, Dan. Sorry, everyone. My internet decided to kick me out. I missed this presentation, and so I'm blaming it on Mercury's retrograde. So <laughs> moving on from C what is a CEC project, we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So funding restrictions. Your application will ask you how you plan to spend CAC's funds. And CAC's funds can be used for most project expenses. This can include project supplies, the cost of paying artists or staff, administrative time pulling together this project, pulling permits, or other logistic details. Um, we're pretty, we allow a lot of things to be covered under CEC funds. However, there are a handful of expenses that CEC cannot fund, um, cannot be used for, and those include fundraising, food and beverage, cost of receptions, re-granting, tuition or scholarships, awards and prizes, capital expenses, and travel outside the United States. Your project can include these things, however, and have this can include these things, but those expenses need to be covered from your matching funds, so, and not your CAC funds. Next slide, please. By now, you have likely received an email informing you that your organization has been moved to the application round and has, with an indicated maximum grant request amount. If you haven't, like I said previously, do not worry, we're still processing those, so you should receive those, that email in the next few days. However, if you are curious about your maximum grant amount, please reach out to your program manager um, via email. So for project support two, the maximum grant amount is $5,000. However, if your project is only $6,000 total, then your project grant must most likely be only be 3,000, which is half of your project expenses. For project support one, it's somewhere between $5,000 um, to $25,000. However, if your grant lands less than $7,000, we would recommend that you apply for Project Support 2 because you are a likelihood of receiving full funding through Project Support 1, or Project Support one, 2, or Project Support 1, it's a little less likely that you'll receive full funding. Talk to your program manager if you have questions about that. In addition to your organization's maximum grant amount, 
the request amount could be more, no more than half of your overall project's cost. So if your grant is $25,000, that's a maximum grant amount that you can request, your project expenses must be $50,000 or more. Um, I've already used example for project support too, but again, if your total cost for your project is $10,000 and your maximum grant amount is $5,000. CAC grants are matching grants, so you will also want to consider the amount that you can realistically match. What successes have you had in the past in raising funds or obtaining other grant dollars? Request amounts that your project actually needs. And for project support too, um, half of the matching in-kind donations, so that's volunteer hours, space, um, or anything that is given, donated to you as part of this project. Next slide, please. And that ends my part. So I will turn it back to Dan. Thank you, Dan, for stepping in while I was disconnected. Yeah, no problem. Hello again, everybody. Dan again. Uh, and uh, we're going to turn the page and talk about the actual application. We're not going to go through each question in the application, but we are going to touch on every section of it. Um, remember, as, as Luis mentioned earlier, Project Support 1 applicants have a more Rural application process and project support two applicants have a shorter, more simplified application. But both follow the same structure. They include a narrative, project financials, and opportunity to upload support materials. Um, and just keep in mind that our panelists are looking for evidence of those funding criteria that Luis mentioned in all of those sections, right? So it, it needs to be, or it should be, um, layered throughout the full application, your evidence of those funding criteria. Um, so the first section is the application narrative. Um, and uh, the first part of that is the organizational overview, which is, it includes your mission statement, your organizational history, a financial snapshot. And you probably won't have to do a lot of work here because most of it will be pre-populated from your eligibility check or from whatever the first time you set up an account uh, with our online system fluid review. But it's important just to make sure that you review it, to make sure that all of that information is up to date, and it tells a consistent story of um, where your organization is today. And the next section is the project basics, and that's the who, what, where, and when of your project, the title, brief summary, um, how much you're requesting from CAC for this project, those project dates that I mentioned earlier, um, that should be not the full calendar year. Um, you know, things like the number of expected participants or audience members. And then there's a question about, is it free or is it fee-based? Is your project free and open to the public or is it fee-based and open to the public? Both are okay. Um, and after that is the application narrative questions, which gets into more of the meat of what your um, project is, what your application is. Um, the first narrative question for both applications is an important one, and I wanted to just take a moment to talk about it. Um, it's asking you to define the community that you intend to work with in this project. And we're calling this one out because, like I said, it is one of the most important questions in the application. And connection to your community is something that's going to thread through your whole application to, to show our panelists um, how your project incorporates that public benefit. So a couple things to point out. Every project is going to be serving a different community. Your community is extremely unlikely to be all of Cuyahoga County. So if you say the residents of Cuyahoga County are your community, you're gonna have a hard time demonstrating that the 1.2 million people of Cuyahoga County are your organization and this project's uh, primary community. So be specific. Um, who is part of this project and who is that project for? What is your relationship with that community and how do you plan to work with that community during the project? Clearly defining your community and how your organization connects with that community is going to make it a lot easier to describe your project's public benefit throughout the application and through our panelists. All right, so um, this slide looks familiar because we want to revisit um, this, this section about asset-based thinking. Um, and part of working with your community is recognizing, like, like Luis had already said, what's already working and in a community and how your work contributes to the assets that already exist in that community. How we talk about the people and communities that our organizations are serving matters and the language we use needs to be respectful 
it should reflect the assets that already exist in those communities. One way to do that is using person-centered language. And now language that stands out to us and to our panelists as not centering equity or being asset-based usually falls into one of two categories. It's either um, language that's describing um, or language that's about uh, how different groups of people, specific groups of people are being described or how they're cultured or in some instances their perceived lack of culture is described. Um, we're going to provide you with some strategies and some examples to illustrate what we mean. And these examples mirror responses that we have received in the past. We're not sharing the names of who shared those things with us or who wrote those things or the organizations or any other markers because we're not doing this to shame any organizations or to make anyone feel bad. Um, but being inclusive of difference is an ongoing learning process for all of us, including those of us at CAC and our organization. And um, we also want to just point out this is not about policing language. It is about ensuring that we support programs that are benefiting communities, um, as well as displaying respect for those communities. So person-centered language or people-first language is one way to ensure that in our language and the way we talk is we are, we're being inclusive. An example here might be referring to people with disabilities as people with disabilities rather than the disabled. Um, or referring to youth who live in the inner city as, you guessed it, youth who live in the inner city rather than inner city youth. And this might seem like a small thing if this is the first time you're hearing about person-centered language or people-first language, but what it does, it affirms that, that people are not defined by just one aspect of their experience or one aspect of their identity. So if this is new to you, I'd encourage you to, to look into it, to think about it, and practice it because it can really help clarify what your thinking is um, and how you perceive the people in the communities that your organization intends to work with. So some of those examples that we mentioned, um, here's an example of language that we would encourage you to avoid. Um, and this is something that we actually got in um, either a report or an application um, in the past few years, uh, where somebody was describing quote, a quintessential inner city school where responsibility and commitment levels in students is lacking. So here, the language that's being used says something about what this person who wrote it was thinking. Um, and if they assume that these two things are mutually exclusive, the inner city and lack of responsibility or commitment, how are they likely to treat the students with whom they're working, right? How are they likely to perceive the students with whom they're working? So, so here's a tip, um, consider using the language of that community. For example, we know that CMSD, the Cleveland schools, refer to their students as scholars. And when you hear the word scholar, it evokes something very different than what you're seeing on the slide or what we, we, we got from uh, this, this applicant. Uh, we usually don't equate scholars with being irresponsible or being uncommitted. All right, so perceptions, can also play out along the lines of race and class. And sometimes we use language without really having a sense of where it might come from. Um, things that we describe as cultured or high culture are often, most often, uh, performed by and observed by people who are white and people who are wealthy. Um, definitions of what art is can be based in a white dominant culture too. While other art forms tend to be performed by and observed by people of color, people who are economically disadvantaged, or people who speak a different language, practice a different religion from those who are in that privileged position, um, it doesn't mean that that's not culture. It doesn't mean that it's devoid of culture. Um, for white organizations who are working with or working in communities of color especially, uh, recognize when you are centering whiteness, white dominant culture, and what your uh, white dominant culture leads you to, to identify as culture versus culturelessness or a lack of culture. So here's some other examples here from applications and reports that we've seen. Um, quote, our program provides access to culture that these people would never have otherwise. Quote, including a performance in a traditionally culture core neighborhood. Quote, we will be working in communities that don't have a lot of beauty. What we need to keep in mind, again, thinking back to asset-based thinking, is that culture is always present 
and while there's value in having different experiences, what you are bringing to the community is not necessarily better than what's already there, what's already present. Maybe it's just different. Also keep in mind, your organization is gaining something by being able to share your gifts with the community beyond this typical audience. You're gaining something. It's a mutual exchange and not a one-way transaction. So it might be helpful to ask yourself, what's different for you and your organization as a result of being able to connect to a new or different audience? And so just a few more tips. Um, some questions that you can ask yourself in order to support using more inclusive language, which we believe links directly to thinking more inclusively. We're excited to see how this might shift some of your submissions, and frankly, the approach of white-led organizations and how they do their work in communities across the county. Applications that don't demonstrate respect for their community do not deserve public funding. Projects that are premised on a disrespectful understanding of a community do not deserve public funding. We see this as a work in progress, and as I mentioned, we're on the same journey too at CAC. Um, so some tips. Um, imagine that the, the members of the community that you're writing about are reading your application. How would they feel as a result? Would they feel respected and valued? Ask yourself what assumptions you might be making about the community with whom you want to work. Are you stereotyping them in any way? And if you've been a past grantee, I'd encourage you to go back and review your previous applications to see where did your language miss the mark and what can you do differently this time? Finally, there's value in engaging staff or, or team members who may have direct ties to the communities that you want to serve. For example, people of color or multilingual members of your team. The truth is your whole team uh, needs to be growing their capacity in this area, so you can't expect certain members of your team to, to carry the water for everyone, um, because this only serves to reinforce those same inequities that we're trying to mitigate. All right, so let's move on to talk about goal setting. Um, every applicant is required to set one project goal. This is a chance to let panelists better understand what your organization wants to achieve by doing this project. It's also a chance to show the thoughtfulness that your organization is putting into the project planning. So your goal should not just be to complete the project, right? We know you want to do that. But what's the outcome? What's the purpose of this project? And what's the benefit to your organization or to your community? So you'll be asked a two-part question that you see on the slide there. Uh, basically, what do you want to accomplish and how will you measure your progress? And this is an opportunity to explain to panelists why your organization is doing this project and a chance to demonstrate your thoughtful project planning. So we have a couple just examples that I'd like to share with you. Um, the first one is from Westside Community House, um, who does a program, has done a project for a number of years called Summer of Sisterhood. Their goal, 30 girls and 20 alumni will combine the power of their voices to create a CD recording and a live performance of their original work, increase their appreciation for the written and spoken word inspire their local community, and experience firsthand the satisfaction of persevering to complete an ambitious project. When asked how you measure progress, they list a number of different steps, completion and production of the CD, successful final performance um, of their work and curated past works in front of a live audience, increased engagement with a variety of literature as evidenced by increased attention and participation in discussions, weekly evaluation by staff, teaching artists, peers, in the areas of music, dance, theater, poetry, um, and the overall contribution to the ensemble of production, and then a self-evaluation. Um, what I like about this goal and why we think this one is strong is it provides a lot of additional detail on why Westside Community House, a social service organization, wants to do this project. Um, they care about youth development, and that comes through strong in the goal and in the measurement. Um, their steps to measure progress also show a thoughtful process to get there. So we would say this is a strong goal. Another example, a second example, is from the Old Brooklyn Community Development Corporation, also a strong goal uh, for their One Old Brooklyn project. Um, the goal is for residents to begin recognizing themselves as One Old Brooklyn and increase patronage in local businesses of the neighborhood by 5% from the beginning of the project year to the end of the project year. I won't read through the full measurement, but there's, there's a, a well thought out process um, in there as well. And uh, we wanted to highlight this one um, because remember that not every applicant to this grant program is going to have a primary mission of arts and culture. Why would a CDC, a Community Development Corporation, want to do an arts and cultural project? Well, this goal connects the project right back to their mission, right? To build community and to support the businesses in that community. 
kind of connects right back to the community that they defined earlier in their application. So this is another good, strong example of a goal. All right, so let's talk about the next section of the application, which is the project budget. Um, we won't get too much into uh, the, the finer details of budgeting, so I'm sure you'll be grateful for that. Um, but every applicant is going to need to talk about their project's finances. Remember, project support one applicants who have a more uh, detailed application will have a full project budget. Project support two will have simplified project financials section. Um, but since project support grants are matching grants, um, you will need to share your plan to raise those matching, the matching income for both grant programs. You don't need to have those income sources committed at the time of the application or, or have money in the bank already, uh, but your plan should be detailed enough to inspire confidence that your organization can meet the matching requirements. Um, you will also be asked to explain the project's expenses. Where's the money going to? Specifically, what will you spend the CAC portion of those funds on? Again, this is where Project Support 1 applicants will be asked in greater detail than Project Support 2. Um, a good suggestion would be to try to anticipate what questions a panelist might have about your budget and use the optional narrative questions in the finance section to explain that. Um, and then one word about in-kind support. Donations of time, space, materials, and or services are, are considered in-kind contributions. And while for Project Support 1, you can't use those as part of your matching funds, um, but you can use them to talk about the engagement that your, that your project and that your organization has. So if you have committed volunteers or folks who are donating space and materials, that's great to include, but remember that doesn't count as part of your, your match. For Project Support 2, a smaller grant program of up to 5,000, dollars, you can use in-kind contributions as up to 50% of your, your matching amount. Um, but in-kind donations are not required. Um, and then one note about volunteer labor, if you're unsure how to set the value of volunteer labor, we use a figure from Independent Sector, um, which is a nationwide uh, organization that has set the, the value of volunteer labor for last year at $25.43 per hour. Um, so if you're looking for a figure to use, you can use that one. If you want to set your own, you're, you're welcome to do that as well. All right, um, I'm going to move on to a section that India mentioned earlier on in the presentation and just go in a little bit more detail about the question that we added about um, COVID-19 project preparation. So for this year's application, we've added this question um, just regarding your approach to how you're carrying out your project in the context of an ongoing pandemic. Um, the question asks, at the time of this submission and in response to COVID-19, what public measure, what public health measures and precautions are you incorporating into the planning of your project? Um, give us your best thinking at the time of the application. Um, we need to know that public projects have a real plan to protect public health. So this is a required part of a complete application. And if your response here is insufficient, we will work with you to update it. Um, one thing's for sure, and that's the situation will continue to shift between now and when you plan to carry out your project. We know that your plans are likely to change between now and the implementation of your project, and that's okay. Um, and then we're not sharing these responses with our panelists. We're gonna inform all of our panelists that all eligible applications have a plan to address public health, but they're not gonna be reviewing that. They're not gonna be judging that. They're gonna be focusing their review solely on the funding criteria as it relates to your project as you lay it out in the rest of the application. So we're the only ones who are gonna see your response to this question. All right, so support materials is the last part of the application. Um, support materials enhance your narrative and they help bring your organization's work to life, especially for somebody who's unfamiliar with your work. As Louis mentioned, all of our panelists are from outside of Cuyahoga County and not familiar with your organization or its work. So support materials can be images, they can be videos, they can be links to online pages, survey results, letters of support, anything that's gonna help a panelist understand your organization or your project. Um, we encourage you to carefully consider what materials will best support your application narrative and demonstrate that you meet the funding criteria. Every year, our panelists give advice to applicants and they say, choose your support materials carefully. Don't phone it in here. Um, 
you are required to have a minimum of one and a maximum of three support materials. Again, don't do the minimum. Do what's going to best um, explain your project and bring your project to life for our panelists. Um, project support one applicants will need to upload two additional items, their board list and their data arts funder report. The data arts funder report you've already completed. It's part of your eligibility check, but we, you will need to re-upload it. So, Again, when you're choosing those support materials, just carefully consider um, which ones you want to be using. Um, sometimes your go-to photos, your go-to videos uh, that you might use for other applications may not actually be the most powerful support materials you have. I always encourage folks, if they have them, to, to consider letters of support, which are not as cool as splashy photos, but sometimes really demonstrate the commitment and that connection to the community that you're working with. Um, a good support material is recent, it's relevant, um, it's high quality, uh, and um, you might consider combining images into one file, like a collage like you saw at the front of this, this webinar, to give yourself to uh, incorporate a diverse array of things in one support material. But don't submit an incredibly long article, don't submit a 20 minute video, because panelists don't want to sit through that, right? <laughs> they don't have attention to be able to necessarily identify what it is that you want to highlight in a 20 minute video or in a 15 page article. Really make sure that they see the things that you want to stand out. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about the Data Arts Funder Report. And again, this is only for Project Support 1 applicants. Uh, Project Support 2 applicants don't need to worry about this part. Um, project support one, uh, you will need to upload, re-upload that data arts funder report through most of the recently available fiscal year, preferably 2019, but we'll take 2018 this year um, due to some uh, financial filing date changes from the IRS. Again, this should already be completed if you're doing project support one, but you'll just need to re-upload it. Um, the funder report contains programmatic and financial data from the past two years. And that data might support your application narrative or it might tell a different story. So it's important for you to review your funder report so you know what story is telling. You should also check to see how your budget lines up with your data arts funder report. Do you have a history of raising income from the sources included in your budget? Is your project budget appropriate considering the organization's recent financial history um, or your recent programming history? There is a question, it's an optional question in the application that gives you space to explain any inconsistencies or add any information to help panelists better understand how your attendance, program, or financial data connects to your application. Again, take the time to review your funder report and answer this question thoughtfully. If you're doing Project Support 1. If you're not, don't worry about it. <laughs> All right, so some key takeaways. Uh, start now. If you haven't started already, start now. If you're still waiting to hear from us on, on the eligibility determination, you can look in the guidelines and see the questions of the application. You can be planning those out, planning your responses out now. Review the guidelines. As Luis mentioned, review the funding criteria. Have it uh, open in a new tab uh, as you're completing the application, or if you've got a printer, I don't in my home office here, you can print out that funding criteria and have it on your, your desk next to you or wherever you might be working from this year. Um, gather your support materials and again, take the time to, to gather thoughtful support materials that are gonna help you tell your best story. And then remember, complete your application before August 6th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time, no matter where you might be working from, we're here on Eastern time, so 4.30 p.m. Eastern on August 6th. Um, <clears throat> if you have questions, you can always contact us. Our contact information is here. Um, if you're a, if you're a current grantee, uh, either Luis, Heather, or myself are your, um, program manager, please reach out to us. Um, if you're a first time grantee, uh, we'll make sure we connect you with the right program manager. And then for technical questions, India can, can answer just about anything. Uh, so India's contact is there as well. Um, there's additional resources on our website, guides, videos, tip sheets, you can contact us for public records if you need, want to see what your organization submitted as an application last year, or what similar organizations to yours might have submitted, or what the panel results were. All of it is public record. All of it is available. Contact us. It's the best way to get that information. If you're doing data arts, the funder report, 
they have their own help desk. They are incredibly helpful. Um, look up their information through their website, culturaldata.org. And then we'll also be hosting some online Q&A sessions also through Zoom, or we can have some more time to answer one-on-one -on -one questions with applicants uh, in the weeks ahead. Those dates should be available on our website. So that does it for our webinar. I know we're coming right up at 1 p.m. So we clacked that pretty good, didn't we? <laughs> um, if there's any questions now, we can, we can stay on for a moment. Um, if anybody has specific questions, remember you can enter them in the chat box. Um, if not, you can feel free to reach out to your program manager. Or, like I said, we'll have those upcoming online community sessions. Luis or India, anything else that, that you might want to add? No, just in the chat function, I sent out the funding criteria handout. So it's just the handout itself. That's also available in the guidelines, but this is just a handout if you want to print that or just save that onto your desktop. So I sent that in the chat function. And our Q&A sessions will be July, um, July 8th and July 23rd. And that's available on our website. Great. Thanks, Luis. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I want to thank you all for attending. It's great to see everybody's name in the participant uh, box. Uh, we'll look forward to connecting with you uh, either in person, on the phone, email, one way or another. Uh, and we're looking forward to working with you all in the year ahead. Thanks for your time. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. <clears throat>